Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me today Scott Drake. Scott Drake interests me because he is looking at how do we make leaders develop them faster. And in today's world, we feel that pressure of how do we build and grow people faster and faster. Our demands for businesses are do what you need to do in less time. And that means the leaders have to do that, too. So, Scott, please share with our audience your journey, how you got to this, and um, some of your lessons. Yeah, sure. So, uh, thanks for having me on, Lois. It's it's good to be here. Um, Yeah, I started out in tech. I started as a computer programmer. And early in my career, I spent some time out at Microsoft. And, and, you know, so I was one of those high achievers, one of the the people who was really uh, good at at my craft, good at my skill of, of, in my case, computer programming. And I knew I always wanted to go into leadership because I wanted to tackle bigger projects than I could do with my own two hands. So I studied a lot and I prepared a lot. And, you know, eventually I left Microsoft and came back to my home in Kentucky. And my boss from Microsoft called me up and he said, hey, come lead a team of 10 engineers for a startup I'm doing in California. So so that was great. It was exactly the type of opportunity I you know, felt like I prepared myself well to do. And I get out there and I did a lot of things really well. I, you know, organized the work and I kind of was, was doing a good job, you know, with project management and some of those things. But when it came to leadership, and what I consider leadership is, is how do you work through others to get things done? Uh, I wasn't doing a good job, right? And about half that team may as well not have been there. You know, I didn't know how to help them solve problems without me just taking the work away and doing it myself. And there were just some basic mistakes that I was making that I didn't even understand I was making. So long story short, it took me about 10 years to really become what I feel like was a competent and good leader uh, with psychological safety and some of those things that we talk about today, would, you know, I didn't even know about back then. And so, so the problem I see today is that I have all these new leaders coming up on my teams and they're going through the exact same learning curve that I did. But I don't have 10 years to watch them wreck my teams while they figure this out, right? I can't have them render half the team ineffective because I can't coach problem solving. So for me, it became, how do we really shortcut this? And that's what I spent about five years researching. And I left a a role in medical education earlier this year to focus my next 10 or 15 years on this problem. This is just a problem that I think we need to solve. And I'm excited to go solve it. So where do you say you figured out a way of truncating it? It's humans we're talking about, human Mm -hmm. behavior, mindset, Mm -hmm. experiences, human experiences. You have the learning that goes to the unconscious mind that controls a lot of the emotions and responses. So how have you done that? So it starts with awareness, right? A lot of people come into leadership with false beliefs. They believe that I am the leader because I was the best computer programmer or I'm the best accountant, right? Uh, The leader's job is to have the answers, right? Uh, they, uh, a false belief is that the leader is the leader because they have all the answers or that the team won't trust or respect me if I don't have all the answers. So a lot of us come into leadership with these false beliefs that are really easy to flip. And a lot of people are very happy when you flip them. When you, when you let somebody know who's stressed out that their team won't respect them because they don't have all the answers, that they don't have to have the answers. And if they will instead challenge their team to go find the answers and to, to learn to do some of those things of working through others, then a lot of times it's a fairly quick transition. It's just they didn't, they, they came at it with those false beliefs. So, you know, specifically some of the ways we do it is, is we just, we, we point out what I call moments that matter, that leadership happens in these small interactions between people. Like somebody brings you a problem and asks for your help to solve it, or when you're delegating something, or when somebody shares an idea with you and you see all the problems, right? You can't just blurt out all the problems. So it's it's in those small moments. And by getting people to stop and recognize those moments and reflect on those moments and journal on those moments and be aware of what they really need to be delivering, then you can actually flip people pretty quick into to, to stop doing some of those damaging behaviors and start behaving more like a leader. So that's one piece. Okay, so part of that is you have to have a system that allows you to observe or the leader themselves has a way to stop, pause, and assess how they handled that 
and then get coached on how they could do that better. So is that part of your process? It is. And, and the coaching is the coaching I consider to be somewhat optional. I also think study groups can be good. I think, I think informal things can be good. So it doesn't always have to be work with a coach, but it is very much the, the journaling and the reflecting and the stop at the end of every day and, and go through some journaling prompts. You don't have to answer every prompt every day, but those are some of the things that we teach people to do to just start to be aware of those moments and to, and to understand the, the good and bad things that can happen in those small interactions and, and, to, and to really reflect on those and, and to do better. So yes, it is, it is part, of, part, of, uh, part of that process, yes. Okay, so you're talking about leaders, they're mm-hmm. drivers, they mm-hmm. like to go boom, 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 let's get it mm-hmm. done, right? They're not reflective people, generally speaking. So how do you get them to pause and really seriously reflect? So for me, it took burning out. Right. So, so a lot of times you have to go to where their pain is. Where's your pain? Like what, why are, why are you seeking training? Right. Or why, you know, or why does your, you know, so, so some of those things it's, it's, if you tie it back to some of those things and that's where you can get people to stop, you can also go into results, right? A lot of times for me, I wasn't getting results without being able to put in 70 or 80 hours a week to do it. So how do you get results? And maybe I'm part of the problem with that. So for me, it, it, the, the best way I found to do it is go to the pain. Go to the pain. Okay. So you have a process, you you call it the jump coach. Is that Mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, we have an accelerator. Yeah, we have an accelerator program that is that is the main training program within jump coach right now. And it's it's what we try to run most people through is that accelerator program. So can you share with us a little bit what that accelerator program looks like? Sure. So it's it's three parts. So the first part is mindset. Uh, it's, it's, it's helping people understand that they have to think differently as a leader, right? Being a leader is not just the growth of being the great computer programmer or the great accountant. It is truly a different job and you have to think about it differently. You have to gauge your own success and attach your ego to something different. So that's the first piece is until, cause until people do that, they're not going to be successful in some of the later stages. The second step is to, we give them a scorecard. Uh, if you think of our scorecard, it's kind of like a map of New York city and a lot of leaders you know, kind of fly into New York, having never looked at a map and have no idea how big the city is or everything that they can possibly go do. And they walk out of the airport and they stop two miles away from the airport and never go any farther because they don't know. They don't, they have no idea of what this entire landscape looks like. So the second part is we give them a scorecard and we give them things that they can observe and see, how am I doing? And we talk about some of the conflicting goals. You know, the, the goals of getting results is sometimes conflicting with having an engaged team. Right. You, 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 those often you have to balance those in some way. So we talk about just the broad scope of leadership and all the facets. And then we, th- that's the second part. And then the third part is we teach them uh, a method to continually improve throughout their career. Right. You're not going to go to one workshop and master the nine jobs and the four goals of leader. You're going to spend the rest of your career adapting to the unique challenges of your day to day. That's going to change. Like this year is very different than last year. You know, look at all the resignations and all that stuff happening, right? You have to be adaptable and continue to adapt as a leader. So we teach them a process to adapt. So it's three steps, mindset, scorecard, and then becoming adaptable over time. That's, that's our process. And and that's an accelerator that can be self-directed training, it's about four hours of training intended to be done over anywhere from 12 weeks to about 10 months, depending on how quickly they want to go through it, or we do coaching with it as well. Okay. So let me understand that if I'm a company mm-hmm. and I'm wanting to grow my leadership team and I want them to really accelerate at that leadership process mm-hmm. in four hours and some work, they would be able to really get the essence of what they need. Is that correct? So there's three lessons that are each anywhere from 60 to 75 minutes. So the first lesson is the mindset, and then it has three developmental assignments to go with it. So really what I, what I suggest people to do is to spend at least a month on that first lesson. Okay. Week one, let's just go through the lesson. Week two, we're going to go through the first developmental assignment, which is going to get you journaling. It's going to get you observing your world. Week three is going to be to start experimenting. It's going to start to say, okay, now that you understand these situations are what really matters, how can you do them better? Right. I'm not going to give you all the answers. Right. But I'm going to help you find the ways And the course is going to help you find the ways to to do it better. Right. And the third one is to dig into your own strengths and weaknesses as a person, as a leader. Right. So so it's a lesson coupled with developmental assignments. So each of those lessons, we recommend they spend at least a month working through and we can accelerate it some. If I'm working with an executive who's already done a lot of work on emotional intelligence, then we can speed that part up. 
but they still most would need some idea what the scorecard is and some idea of how do I become more adaptable. So some of those things. So yeah, that's typically what the process would look like. So tell me, Scott, what kind of people, what kind of businesses come to you for help in this area? We work with um, a range of organizations. Like we just, one we just onboarded is a, is a rapidly growing accounting firm. So they're starting to hire some, they're starting to number one, elevate some of their younger accountants into, into more leadership positions that they want to maybe build out teams around, or they may want to build out different divisions of the organization around that. So we're coming in and we're doing coaching at that low level. That's, that's a little bit longer form. We may work with them for 10 sessions to walk them really through this full thing. But then with the executives, we're just going to work with them for a few sessions to make sure that they understand what we're doing with their team. And they understand this is the scorecard we're giving your team. And it's helpful if you understand the scorecard too, because these are the things they're going to be talking about, right? They're going to start talking in terms of, are we hiring for intrinsic motivation as much as we're hiring for uh, what we can afford to pay, right? They're going to start talking about these different things. So it's helpful if the executive team does that. So so we do that anywhere. We do that anywhere from, you know, working with full companies like that to just individual leaders um, who want to come to us and, and say, you know, I'm working with um, uh, one lady who's a, a data privacy manager, a new manager for uh, a city out west, and she's just kind of struggling with her CFR two level up CISO, and she's like, how can we do better? So that's you know similar things. Her mindset was a little bit off, and once I kind of got her thinking about things the right way, then she's actually been able to improve her ability to lead, but then also her relationship up with some of her managers as well. I think that's such a big, big issue right now. I mean, you, you look, you, you mentioned it to begin with, the turn that we're seeing within companies. Part of that is that's a culture that many organizations have established over time. And now they're perhaps reaping some of the side effects, the consequences of that, that philosophy. But I want to talk because of that, with you a little bit about that C-suite, because you talk about getting that group to work together. Those are all leaders, all who are used to being right, all who are used to having their way. And now they've got to come and work together in a cohesive way that the people under them will respect and want to grow into. So how do you do that with that level of people, a group? So again, I think it, it, number one, there's no magic bullet, right? Everything you just said is hundred percent true, right? And, and that there are, there are just some situations and some people that just don't want to cooperate, right? They don't want to, to, to play. But I think, again, you go to what are some of the challenges that they're facing, right? Are they facing some of the challenges around? Are they not getting the results they want? Are they dealing with turnover issues? Are they dealing with cultural issues? Are they, you know, what are the types of problems that they're having? And almost every type of problem that they're having can be tied back to leadership. And so it's really, if they want to improve their leadership, then one of my favorite questions to ask is, how do you know you're doing a good job as a leader? And you can imagine asking that to a basketball team, right? Or imagine asking that to the coaching group of a basketball team. How do we know we're a great team? How do we know we're doing good jobs as coaches? And if you go to leaders and you ask that question, you're going to get almost a different answer from every single leader. And that alone should tell them that we are likely not as effective as we could be if we all had a consistent way to answer this question. We were all working toward the same goals with a similar playbook. So it really, to me, it still comes back to what is their problem? What are the problems that they're trying to solve? What's the underlying? And then uh, a lot of times it's leadership is the problem. And if it is, then, then a lot of times it's because they have different definitions. They're working toward different goals and they're never going to be successful as long as they're working toward different goals. So let me give you an example. And I'd love to have your feedback and, and thoughts on this. Let's take a fairly large organization. Uh, 10, let's say 25,000 employees, maybe 50,000, so large, okay? And the company has done very well. They've exceeded generally their, their goals, but in the last three to five years, they're beginning to see a decline in some of what's happening. Part of it is due to market, um, but the pressure on leadership is to produce results. It has had a philosophy of churn, burn, churn, burn, churn. So um, in, with that philosophy and the need to grow and a team that is not working well together at the C-suite, where would you begin? 
what what are the issues that um, that are stopping organizations like that? They've all been leaders, proven leaders, or they wouldn't get there. Well, so for, it's a big question, right? And, it and is I, a big and question, and it's hypothetical. A, it is hypothetical, and there's a lot of things that like my personally, the way I would address it is I would start to get to know the people. I would want to get to know the people on that team and understand what motivates them. Why are they here? Right. Are they here because they love the mission of the organization? Are they here because this is the job they got out of college and they've risen to the ranks and they're just kind of here because it provides a good life for their family? Why are they here? Right. What is, what do they want out of it? What are their goals? And it's hard to bring a team together if they all have different goals, personally. Um, so to me, I think I, I would start that level with any team, whether it's you know the the twenty most senior people in a twenty thousand person company or the twenty people running in a startup, is to really try to understand why they're there. What do they want to get out of it? Because until you understand that, I don't think you can understand how to motivate them to want to work together. And it may be that some of them won't. They won't play. They don't want to work together. Right. Uh, maybe what's good for the business is not good for their personal goals. Right. There's, you're just going to see all kinds of problems like that. So I don't again, I don't think that there's a a single solution for it, but I think it would start with getting to know the people and really understanding what's what's motivating them and why they're there. And then try to figure out how do you bring some common threads of that motivation to bring them together better as a team. So let me ask the question a little bit differently. Sure. What makes a really good leader? So to me, what makes a really good leader is that they can they they are balancing again. There's four confl- con- four conflicting goals of leadership, in my opinion, or they can be sometimes conflicting. They're not always conflicting. It's getting results with an engaged team for enthusiastic customers while creating more leaders, right? If if when I kind of broke down and said, okay, what is what is leadership? What are I broke down the learning objectives of dozens of MBA and leadership programs and, you know, various different programs, a lot of like Marshall Goldsmith stuff and different stuff. So to say, what are they actually teaching? What are they trying to do? And everything fed back to one of those goals, right? But those goals are not always in agreement, right? You get results, but as you said, you may burn out your team, right? You may churn and burn your team. You may churn and burn your customers, right? So, but there's some industries that you can't do that. Or some roles, like again, I came out of tech, and if you have a churn and burn attitude with a high competition area like tech, then you're going to lose all your team. You can't do that. So you have to balance results with your team. So for me, good leadership is saying, I understand the unique challenges of my industry, of my company, of my board of directors, of what I'm being challenged to do. And I understand that I have some conflicting goals, and and I'm going to balance them as I think best. And then I'm going to sell that to others in my organization. So they understand that we're working toward the same goals that have the same balance, that we can't get results always at the expense of our team, all right, or at the expense of shortcutting our long-term development of new talent. Um, so, so yeah, so to me, that's, that's what I would say a good leader is. They can work through others in healthy ways, and they're balancing those four things. So I appreciate that because I think one of the ways really a a leader can look quickly at how effective things are is to look at what's happening with those four things. And when there's a problem, then it's an easy thing to say, okay, how do we reshape, rethink this in order to resolve that? And um, that takes it away from me, me personally as a leader, and allows you to put it in, in an objective context. I think the other thing that I'm seeing so much right now, Scott, and I don't know what your experience is and would love your opinion on that is things have really changed in the market. And it's changed, I think, in many ways more for that mid-sized group of companies. But I think it's hitting also the very large companies. The difference is the mid-sized companies are aware. I think the large companies have been insulated and they're only just beginning to wake up to things are changing. Mm -hmm. And so how do you help people look at that, that things are changing and what does that really mean for us as leaders? Well, part of it is the bigger the company, sometimes the more detached I've found 
right? And and I don't have as much. You you probably have a ton more experience in big companies than I do, right? I've come up through a lot of startups and a lot of mid-sized companies, so it, it's hard for me to really talk from my own personal experience about some of the things. But just you know, but, but from some of what I have seen and some of the reasons I've gravitated more toward the mid-sized companies is that they tend to be more aware and more and more engaged, and and they often have reasons, right? It's it's um. Again, a lot of times when you get into mid-sized or small-sized companies, the leadership team is there for a reason. A reason they're on a mission, right? There's something about why they're there that they care about. It's it's not it's more than just bringing out another product line to put in the grocery stores, right? That it's it's there's something often with those mid mid to smalls that that can really drive you know people to be aware. Um, so again, I think it just goes back to you, what do they care about, right? And then um, I think if people aren't paying attention to change, then they're not, they're just not going to be around very long. Uh, I think it becomes a survival thing for, for them that eventually they'll see it and hopefully they see it before it's too late. Uh, but, but yeah, they just have to be aware. They have to pay attention. So let me ask you something a little bit different. Sure. What do you think is most exciting and gives you the most optimism and hope for businesses that you work with today? I think I think um, the blessing of COVID is work from home, and it's this idea of well-being and work-life balance. Uh, about 15 years ago, I, I started a company, and I left a, a mid-sized company, really rapidly growing mid-sized company, where I had a lot of opportunity to grow, but I didn't want that lifestyle, right? <laughs> I did, you know, so I was a little bit ahead of the curve on this idea of I don't want to have to go to an office for 50 hours a week. I want some freedom in my schedule. I want to be able to go to the grocery store at two o'clock in the afternoon if I need to, right? I need to go uh, run a family errand. I can go run a family errand. So I think what excites me the most coming up is I think that, again, this I've been fascinated by this relationship between employer and employee changing, and it's changed a lot in the last couple of decades, and I think it's going to continue to change. I think that's going to give new challenges for leaders. Uh, I think it's going to give more challenges for people who are, who are organizing and structuring companies. Um, to really create environments that people want to be in, that people can do their best work, uh, that people can can have a good, balanced life. Uh, so, so I'm really excited about about some of the changes in just how we're organizing the idea of work. I think that's going to change. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch the next ten or fifteen years evolve on that one. That implies that we'll also have developed some great ways of measuring and and monitoring people who are working from home because that's one of the issues that I also hear companies talk about is uh, you hear it on both sides right you initially heard people saying well now I don't have to <clears throat> ever get dressed and um, I, I wake up I turn on my computer and then I go back to sleep for another hour or two and then I come back so you have that component of employee. I would say most people haven't responded that way, but they certainly exist. But that that raises the issue for the leader: How do I manage this team? So I think there's I think there's a couple of challenges. Number one, I came out of uh, there, there's there's mechanistic work and there's routine work. Or sorry, mechanistic and there's organic. Right? There's right. there's work that's very routine that you're going to put processes and procedures and those things around. Right? And you're often going to have sometimes less skilled or or your workers are going to be very trained to a process. Right? That's one type of work, and that represents a shrinking pool of work within the workforce. And the other type is more creative work, and that's what that's the world I came out of more in tech, where you've got uh, <laughs> my last team. I had a PhD in bioinformatics. I can't tell you exactly what he was doing or how he was doing it. All I had to do was turn him loose on a problem, right? So it's it, the more the work shifts into that, uh, the creative work that requires more of an organic management approach, then management changes. And if a leader is trying to manage creative work through mechanistic approaches or routine work through organic approaches, they're going to struggle, right? So a lot of that that thinking of, I have to control this is a very mechanistic approach and it works for some work, but as more work becomes creative, then it doesn't work anymore. And they have to really adopt a different type of, of philosophy to management as a whole. So it really becomes setting the right goals, KPIs, uh, OKRs around 
the types of problems that you're trying to solve and giving a little bit more autonomy to your team. So I think that's part of it. The other part that we can talk about a little if you want to is just the, how do you really, what I've all, what I miss now, especially in COVID. And when I had my company before, uh, we would get together at least once a month in person. And that has taken that away, right? So I still think even if you have more people go remote, they still need some connection to bring people together. And I think that's going to be one of the other challenges to uh, to this change that's going to, I think, happen in the next decade. I, I, th- I think you're right. I mean, I think people are hungry for connection right now. And they're finding social media is not the answer that they were hoping it was going to be, right? So, um, and, the, and then the other is we're seeing hybrid workplaces emerging as well, but managing the hybrid. And I was speaking with, um, we had a podcast with um, Christopher O'Donnell from HubSpot. And his comment was he thought it was going to favor, especially women in the workplace, because now they didn't have to go to those water cooler conversations and waste time there. It, it, and he, what he observed is that women wanted to get their work done because they need to get home, take care of their families. They didn't, they didn't have the luxury of wasting what they perceived as wasted time. Men, on the other hand, saw it as essential for their upward movement. So there was no wasting of time. But those conversations are now not the way they used to be. And so part of the question that I struggle with is, will we have now a new separation of workers and what will that really mean? I think we will. I think, I mean, I had a conversation yesterday with my wife who's, who's, she's, she's, uh, uh, she became a, a software tester, quality assurance tester about three or four years ago. So she's pretty good at it, but she's still kind of learning the job and it, and she's been remote the whole time. So she's kind of, was just expressing some of her frustrations that, you know, when she was uh, doing a publishing work and she was in an office, then they could just have those water cooler conversations were great opportunities to learn. And now she just doesn't have those informal two minute conversations with a peer to figure out how do you do this? Right. So there's just some stuff along that line that, that I think, that I think is challenging. I think it's um, you know, I think it's going to have to be deliberate people are going to have to recognize as a challenge. I think it's one of the things leaders are going to have to say, how do we start to build some of these? How do we build, how do we foster this interaction? And, you know, like I said, in, in the previous role, we would get ready together at least once a month. And, and you're going to have to find ways to do these things because everybody needs it. Right. I'm an introvert. Right. That may be the other definition. Right. You have introverts who love it. Right. And you have the extroverts who are going crazy. Right. So it's that may be the other uh, more than men and women, you might get into the introvert versus extrovert that you really have to make sure those extroverts are given some outlet for that, that to get that energy out. So true. The time goes very quickly when we're discussing these things. So Scott, it, we're, we're almost out of time. What have we left out that you think is really important for the audience to know about things that you do, that you've learned, that you really want to make sure you leave with the audience? You know, I think, again, I think leadership isn't a skill. Like most people already have the skills to be good leaders. It's about thinking about it correctly. And it's about understanding all the facets of the job. And once you do those two things, you can become a, a, an effective leader pretty quickly. So to so really don't be, don't feel like, um, you know, there's only about 10% of people who, who I think, lack, I saw a study that lacked the kind of the emotional intelligence or the empathy to be good leaders. But I think most other people can really become good leaders and be effective. So um, so give people the opportunity, uh, get people the right training at the right levels. And, and, and I think we can really uh, grow a lot more leaders that we need uh, in the decades ahead. I, I think people want to do well. I mean, I think in their heart, um, you may look at somebody and go, wow, that's not working out. But when you stop and talk with people, often their real desire is to do very well. They just don't know how to how to manage that so they can accomplish their their goal, their purpose. Mm-hmm. Scott, um, if people want to learn more, your information will be about your website will be in our show notes. Mm-hmm. So please go check out Scott. I think um, rapid leadership training is going to be so, so needed. So look at your needs in your organization. Look at Scott's information on his website. And we encourage you to get in contact with him. 
So Scott, thank you so much for being with us today on Building My Legacy podcast. Thanks so much. It was a great time. I enjoyed the conversation very much. You are so welcome. And for those of you who are listening to Building My Legacy podcast, remember to also visit us at our website at www.buildtomorrowwiththenumber2.com. Thanks so much, everybody. You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sanstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sanstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.